so, um, uh, yeah, so I'll be talking about open source software and high performance computing. I'll talk a little, cover some of the things that Julian mentioned. So here's, I'll be giving an intro to HPC. Uh, talk, you know, specifically about open source and HPC, give some examples and talk about some of the strengths and weaknesses and trends. A um, little bit about me, uh, I have 20 years of experience with HPC and data intensive computing. Uh, my focus in, during that has really been on trying to enable scientists to use these large systems to tackle some of their most challenging problems. Uh, uh, over the last um, five years or so, I've also become a big evangelist for the use of containers in HPC. So if you've heard of things like Docker, um, you know, it's trying to use those models <clears throat> in high performance computing and, and scientific computing. So I do that both with a project that I've helped develop called Shifter, as well as on a, a project uh, within DOE called the Super Containers Project. And I'm also a senior member on two genomics related projects, um, KBase and NMDC. So I spend half my time on those. I actually have a PhD in physics from, from Duke, but I don't do any physics these days. It's all computational stuff and supporting others. And I'm father of three. So let's quick, uh, let's start with just in some background on HPC. Um, Julian sort of alluded to some of these things. Uh, so we sort of talk about high performance computing. And one way to say it is just when you're using computing to tackle computational problems that are bigger than what you can do on say your desktop, laptop, or sort of workstation. Uh, and so put another way, it's using big computers to solve hard problems. And uh, I'll show sort of like, you know, what these systems look like and uh, how they change through the ages. So, um, you know, what do they look like? We saw uh, Julian showed a picture of Summit. Here's a picture of the largest, uh, pr the main production system at NURSE called Quarry. Um, these are physically large, typically. Um, you know, something like Quarry can be, um, I think it's, almost 70 cabinets. Uh, so it's multiple rows. You know, these are these take up a lot of floor space at a, in a data center. And they, they require a lot of power and they re require a lot of cooling. So the infrastructure to run these is, you know, a pretty significant factor uh, these days. They, um, unlike say a workstation where you're, you're, they may be built from commodity parts, but you're coupling them together in specialized ways. Uh, one thing is through the network. So they typically have a high speed, low latency network so that the different processors can talk to each other uh, quickly and um, exchange information. And this allows you to couple those together to, to tackle larger problems. They often have um, fast IO systems that are um, combined with it. So these are typically high speed parallel file systems. In fact, we'll hear about uh, Seth in a bit, that's a, an example of um, one such file system. And then and they're managed. So you don't just let people log in and sort of you go wherever and do whatever. You have schedulers and other things to manage how jobs are run on the system and to make sure you don't um, kind of saturate one processor and then have others idle and stuff like that. What types of problems are uh, these systems used for? It's, it's a pretty broad range. And of course, my background is being with the, the Department of Energy and, and NERSC is around the scientific side. So that's the one that I know the most about. And so in our areas, it can be biology, climate, chemistry, materials, uh, it's sort of all branches of physics, um, which astronomy really is one of, you know, all of those things, um, this class of domains are used to uh, use HPC. We also see it in manufacturing. So this can be in um, things like materials design or computer aided design. So the example that was given earlier of like crash codes, this could be simulating how a, you know, a car frame acts in a crash or um, building an airplane, designing an airplane. Weather, obviously both short and medium range forecasting, uh, national security. Um, this could be anything from, you know, trying to find terrorists to trying to um, build weapons. And then uh, also you're increasingly seeing things like finance and other aspects of commerce, especially with the growth of AI and machine learning, you're starting to see um, what, you know, we would have traditionally think of as HPC being used in uh, completely new domains. Um, just a little bit of background about NERSC, which is where I work. Um, 
it is the uh, the Department of Energy in the U.S. is the largest funder of physical science research in the United States. Um, so it it does have certain domains that it kind of focuses on, and those are kind of covered in these uh, these little vignettes below. So biology and uh, the environment. This would include things like climate research, high performance computing, and sort of computer science, uh, materials and chemistry. Uh, various forms of physics and high energy physics, nuclear physics and fusion. And so NERSC has over 7,000 uh, users. So we support a lot of users, a lot of different projects, a lot of different codes. So this is a challenge for, you know, how do you effectively support such a large community with a lot of variation and sort of the types of things that they're doing. Um, as I showed earlier, our, our main uh, uh, production system is Cori. It's a Cray XE40. There's some of the stats on it below. Um, it peaked at number five uh, back in 2016. One thing that's sort of sad about HPC systems is they don't necessarily age very well. Um, you know, there's always the next systems will come out, and because they use newer technology, uh, they'll often, you know, jump ahead of, of, of others. And so, um, you know, when you first build a system, that's when it has its, its most effective kind of capability. In addition to uh, Corey, we also operate a number of other resources, including a large tape archive with 200 plus petabytes of data. We've got a community file system that's used for storing um, kind of results that can be accessed over a long, long period of time. And then uh, we also have a system called SPIN that's for hosting sort of containerized science services. So now let's talk a little bit about open source and HPC. Um, this is just a very brief um, history of HPC. So this only goes back um, you know, about 35 years or so. And most of the pictures are kind of chosen from systems that were at NERSC. Uh, in fact, all of these are, but they're, I think they're representative of the, you know, of what kind of systems you saw during those periods of time. So going back in the, in the mid 80s, you saw very customized solutions. So the example is like the Cray uh, 2 there that had completely specialized hardware, completely customized software. And over time, you've seen those migrate to more open source, open standard types of models. Um, one big revolution was kind of the growth of clusters and really commodity based clusters. So you saw in the mid 90s, um, the first Beowulf cluster, which used commodity parts to build what was, you know, kind of a low end supercomputer at the time. And you've sort of seen that model extend over time. And so if you look at most modern uh, supercomputers these days, they kind of, they typically use commodity components and then have some specialized hardware to make them sort of operate more like a supercomputer. And the integration and the software is sort of another area of, of specialization. So again, you've seen go from, I would say in the sort of the mid eighties from a very closed uh, proprietary model to a much more open source dominant model uh, in, in for now in the present. All right. Um, so why is open source software in, used in HPC? Uh, so a couple of reasons. One is, um, you know, the, this we typically operate at sort of the cutting edge of computing. And a lot of times that means that we need to co-design and co-develop our systems with, with the vendors. Um, you know, we can't do it all ourselves, but we uh, typically have very bright people that understand the problems really well and they are able to contribute. And so open source is a way that they're able to kind of add to the community and as a community uh, build up the infrastructure to support our, our uh, workloads. Uh, like I said, we have a strong contingent of skilled computer scientists, so we're comfortable kind of developing things from the ground up. And I'll give some examples of that later. Uh, a lot of HPC is dominated by academic and government funded research. And so there's a kind of a public interest argument for having the, the products of that um, be as open as possible as well. Um, and then lastly, a lot of the problems that HPC systems are used for are science-based problems, and there's an emphasis on open access for the scientific process itself. And so that's a, yet another reason to use it. Uh, I'm going to show some examples of sort of some soft, uh, two, uh, software stacks just to show kind of where open source components start to appear in that stack. So 
here is just as an example, I took Cray's cluster software stack. I just looked on the internet. This is one that came up and I've kind of put arrows to all the different components that are for, for the most part open source. Um, so as Julian mentioned, Linux is pretty much the de facto operating system in HPC. It's There's some exceptions, but they're very rare these days. And then as you go up the stack uh, through um, different components, you just see that I'll, there's examples of open source versions in almost every layer, right? So that can include things like the communication fabric that's used, uh, the file systems that are used, the resource management and schedulers that are used, um, and on up. And I'll be giving some deep dives on a few of these in, in just a minute. Um, not shown on this one is the applications and libraries themselves that are often developed by the scientific community, for example. Those are almost always open source. Um, they may be um, embargoed at times for people to get out publications, but the end results are typically open source. Um, and just another example, this is from NERSC, and I'm a part of the data analytics and services group at NERSC. We provide sort of user support for people using our systems to do data intensive problems. And this is just a flavor of the different packages that we directly support uh, at NERSC for those workloads. And the main point here is, oh, I think I missed one more, but I, all but these, I, I, there was one more I should have removed, which was the no machine in the top row. But most of these, almost all of these are open source is the takeaway, right? So a few examples of, um, you know, just to go a little bit deeper. So I'll start with um, MPI or the message passing interface. So this is the primary uh, model for how when people build a HPC application, uh, many times what you're doing is you want to take your problem, you decompose it and break it apart and you run different pieces of that on different processors and then they communicate with each other uh, to solve the problem together, right? So for example, with climate, you might say one node takes one part of the earth and you know some part of the atmosphere above it and um and then you distribute that across you know hundreds of nodes or thousands or tens of thousands of processors and each one's kind of modeling the physics inside that domain and then they use something like mpi to communicate between those different um those different nodes uh so this is both um there's open source implementations of MPI, it is itself a standard and there's a forum that maintains it. So it's kind of an open, openly maintained standard. You see that a lot in, um, in these examples. Uh, there's multiple open source implementations such as MPitch, OpenMPI, and MVAPPitch. But there's proprietary versions too, which are typically derived from those um, open source versions. Many of these might have something like a PSD license or other license that allows uh, someone to make a derivative product from that without having to distribute the source. So you couldn't do that with GPL, but a lot of these are licensed such a way that you can. And you see vendors that do that. Um, so open source here provides an avenue, you know, it gives a place where people can, it provides a reference implementation and also allows the research community to contribute to that uh, implementation. Um, we'll hear about another file, uh, file and storage system in a bit, but one, another example is Lustre. It's a scalable parallel file system uh, licensed under GPL, I'm quite certain. This one was actually developed under a Department of Energy contract and that actually mandated it to be open source. And so they wanted to have an alternative that was open and that uh, the lab community could contribute to, for example. And, and uh, so they had a contract to, to develop it. Uh, it's actually gone through a series of acquisitions and it's moved around quite a bit, but it's still there. Um, there's an open source consortium that is the primary open body that steers uh, some of the development and can kind of direction for the community version of, of Lustre. And vendors sometimes have their own forks of it that are still open source, but maybe have their own special extensions. Another example is Slurm. Uh, this is a scheduler. So um, I, as I mentioned earlier, when you're running an HPC system, you need to, uh, you might have hundreds or thousands of users that are all trying to run workloads at the same time. Uh, so you want to, um, you'll use 
the scheduler to manage that. And so the schedulers both give the users a way to submit their jobs, but also a way for the center or the resource manager to uh, people running the system to put policies in on how they want to schedule that workload. Uh, so this one is another pattern that you sometimes see in the HPC community. This one was initially developed uh, at Lawrence Livermore National Lab. And then uh, a spinoff company formed uh, that really was around continuing development of that product, but also and, and providing support. And so then they will get, um, you know, centers like NERSC will have a support contract with SCEDMD. Um, but we at the same time, so we will also contribute our own, uh, contribu you know, make our own contributions to that. So that could be in the form of, here's a new feature that we've implemented and we'll kind of contribute that back to the open source version. And SCADMD's role here is made to make sure that like that's implemented well, that it's, you know, it's tested, uh, you know, and that they can really fully support it uh, in future releases. Uh, so that's a, that's a model you see quite often. Uh, I, you know, I don't want to imply that all software and HPC is open source. It's not, there's plenty of counter examples. Uh, so some are things like compilers and debuggers. Uh, so like the Intel compiler, there's various compilers that are, are, are proprietary still. Some system management tools, I give an example is Bright. Cray also has, for example, some uh, system management tools that they still keep um, proprietary. Resource managers, I showed Slurm, but there's examples that are proprietary as well. Um, low level will be another one. File systems like GPFS. And then a lot of times you see it in ISV applications. And those are typically ones that have commercial applications are the ones that are more likely to be uh, proprietary and closed source. So Fluent and ANSYS are both um, you know, finite element kind of uh, analysis uh, applications used in things like aircraft design or uh, crash analysis. Uh, um, uh, automotive design. And then there's some libraries, I think, as well, that are still proprietary, uh, CUDA being one of them, which is used with the uh, NVIDIA GPUs. A lot of times the reasons that they may keep these proprietary is because it allows them a vendor to kind of differentiate themselves, or there's some commercial market that's willing to and able to pay a lot of money for it and maybe doesn't want to contribute. Or just in some cases, just for legacy reasons, that's how it started out, and it just kind of continues that way through inertia. Um, how do open source? Um, how did how do people build a business with these open source software uh, solutions? So um, there's a couple of different approaches that kind of came to mind for me. Uh, there's probably others that I omitted though. Um, one is bundling. Uh, so it may be that like the the main thing they're selling is a, a hardware system and they'll include the software and some of the support is kind of bundled in with that hardware. Um, so you see that to some degree with uh, something like a, an integrator like Cray that may use open source components as part of their offering. Um, another one is kind of enhanced support or you know, kind of contract support. So, so if you want your problem really to get attention and get developers on it fast, um, then you have a support contract and that makes your problem a little more higher priority than what the community may decide to do. And so Slurm and SCEDMD that I showed earlier would be a, an example of that. Another thing you see is kind of contract development. So sort of pay for the development, but the, the results are open source. Um, we'll use this model at NERSC, for example, we'll do what's called non-recurring engineering. We might, pay for somebody to go develop some new feature and say Slurm, uh, that'll all go back into the open source version. Of course, everybody will be able to benefit from it. Um, but you know, maybe that wouldn't have happened otherwise. Um, so a little bit about strengths and weaknesses of this, of open source and HPC. I think the strengths are, uh, I've already alluded to a couple of these. One is it's shared development allows someone like Nurse to actually contribute ideas and code to a product and make it better. Uh, and in a way that would be harder to do if it was closed source or proprietary. Uh, it gives flexibility, it helps us avoid lock-in. Uh, it can be easier to, to maintain both the code and also to, to maintain systems depending on that code. So having access to the source means we can troubleshoot a problem and maybe figure out what's going on and solve it ourselves without um, you know, needing a vendor to do it, or it means we can more effectively troubleshoot it ourselves in partnership with the vendors. Uh, 
And um, also collaboration. These components sometimes become a hub for, you know, partnerships and collaborative development and helps build sort of a community around around those. So many of these products have their own meetups and user groups that are very uh, active communities. And, you know, it's not just that software that you get from being a part of that community. You also learn things from those other people. The weaknesses, I would say, the number one one I think is sustainability. Sometimes, you know, a lot of energy, especially maybe when something's early stage, you'll get a lot of focus, but then as you, you know, as it sort of sits on the vine for a while, you may have hard time doing ongoing support. It can be very hard for uh, a vendor to build a sustainable business model around this. You know, if there's something out there that's for free, why is somebody going to pay for it? So being able to show enough uh, benefit to the to the customer for them to want to pay for it can be a, a challenge. And to also still have enough, be banking enough to kind of sustain a business from it can be tricky. Gradware would be another challenge, I would say. Some of this stuff comes from the research community, and they may be trying to just get a paper out on it. And so once... But then you become dependent on that. And then how do you sort of sustain it past that point? Uh, that can be a, a serious challenge. Uh, so just lastly, a little bit about trends. I think it, as I would agree with Julian, like open source is kind of pivotal to HPC these days. And I don't see it uh, going away. I think it's become sort of de facto and presumption. You know, you presume it's going to be open source in, in many cases. And you see the concept of open extending beyond the software and really talking to look about the interfaces you use, the APIs you use, the, you know, the governance you use around uh, some of these things is also becoming more open. Uh, in HPC itself, you also see adoption of other kind of cloud software that I think has a strong open source roots. Uh, so Kubernetes comes to example, uh, comes to mind as an example of that. And then we're also seeing in HPC new application areas, especially around AI and machine learning. And many of those are already using open source uh, solutions. And so that's just another way that you're seeing uh, growth of uh, open source in the HPC community. So yeah, just to briefly conclude, it's become critical to the ecosystem. You know, it has, allows us to contribute ideas and code uh, and there's many examples of successful companies. There's examples of, you know, failures too. So it's not a panacea, um, but you know, at this point it's pervasive and it really is extends even beyond the software itself. So that was, uh, that was all I had. I don't know how we're, if we're gonna take any questions or not. Julian, I'll let you drop things from here.